Well, now I've got a little speech and I've got to get all ready for it. But first of all, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be here. Now, I can sing all day, but I get nervous when I have to speak. So you can uh, forgive me. And I'm at the age where I have to wear glasses, too. <laughs> I think it's great that all of you are here because, you know, they're always wanting to know about, you know, all this stuff. Like, but I did want to say that through the years, even though I make jokes about uh, the press, I have depended on you a lot, especially when I have a lot of good things to mention, and we have a lot of wonderful things going on right now. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to uh, announce today was that we're planning a fourth Dixie Stampede dinner attraction in Orlando, Florida. And just in case you're making notes, it's a $20 million project, assuming that the city officials approve everything, and we're very excited about that. It's located on I-4, right in the middle, between Disneyland and Universal Studios. And if all goes well, we'll be opening sometime next summer, 2001. So we're just growing. And second, we've started a partnership in Australia to build a fifth stampede there in Surfer's Paradise on the Gold Coast. And a little later on, I'm sure you're going to be asking some questions, so we'll have more information if you want it. Also outside, they have packets of information on any of the things I mentioned today. If you want more detailed information, you can pick that up on the way out. Of course, you know, this is going to be our 15th season at Dollywood. It just seems like yesterday we started that, and we got a lot of great things going there. And uh, That's our theme park, in case you don't know, back there in the Smoky Mountains. And Of course, we've... Uh, put $100 million into that so far, and we've entertained over 30 million visitors since we started, so we're very, very proud of that. And we're building a new children's attraction for this particular season. It's called Dreamland Forest, and that's going to be our big deal this year. And next year, which we didn't get it done in time, we were planning for it for this year, but we have a big $20 million water park going in. So we're just entertaining all kinds of folks up there in the Smoky Mountains. Of course, you know the Smokies. Might as well get a plug in here. It's the most visited national park in the United States. We get like about 10 million people going through there a year. So we get a few of the spillovers when people get tired of camping up there in the smoke as they come see us. Anyway, you're all invited to come down to the opening. We'll be having our big parade. We always have a parade on Friday night to open everything. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we have our big grand opening, which we're still looking forward to. And of course, a lot of people want to know what I'm actually working on for a lot of my own stuff and I'm writing some um, music for some movies that I'm doing. I'm doing a few television movies of the week. I have a movie that's coming out this fall, hopefully on CBS. It's a gospel musical with me and two black girls singing. We're called Milk and Honey and we actually have a real wonderful story. We haven't cast that yet, but we're looking at people like Patti LaBelle and Gladys Knight or somebody like that, if I'm lucky enough to get them. But anyhow, we've got a lot of fun things going on with that. I'm doing a remake on Turner Classic Movies uh, of the old Judy Holiday movie of uh, Solid Gold Cadillac. Remember that one? So I'm looking forward to that. So I'm doing a lot of things like that in addition to just doing, uh, actually creating some things for feature films through my new production company, which is called Southern Light. I have been blessed, and it always gives me a great pleasure to know that I can do something to try to give back. And working with the kids, no matter how much I joke or kid, I, I really am very, very proud of the work that we're doing through the Dollywood Foundation and with the, uh, the little imagination library that we have going that you spoke about. Of course, uh, most of you know that I grew up in the Smokies, like you mentioned, in a family of 12 kids. Of course, we didn't have anything that money could buy, but we had a lot of good stuff. And I wanted to get involved in education, mostly because a lot of my folks never able to read and write. In fact, my own daddy never had a chance to go to school. And he's one of the smartest people I know, though, in spite of the fact that he didn't get an education. But I often wondered what my dad might have done had he had a chance to get an education. And uh, of course, like I say, there was 12 of us kids and uh, six girls, six boys living back there in the Smokies in a little, you know, most people had like four rooms and a bath. We had three rooms and a path. <laughs> and we had running water when we'd run and get it. Of course, we didn't have television. Well, there was a local show. In fact, we had a little local show there. It was kind of the forerunner of that show they had on a few months ago called How Would You Like to Marry a Multimillionaire? Remember that? Ours was called How Would You Like to Marry Outside Your Immediate Family? <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that one in. Certainly, books were very special, but they were very scarce in our house because we weren't allowed to take 
books home, homework to me was like milking two cows, slopping four hogs, gathering eggs, bringing in water and eggs and doing, you know, doing supper. And that was kind of the way it was because we took books home, which daddy told us not to because they'd get tore up and chewed up by the kids or get rolled up into roll your own cigarettes, you know, somewhere back there or ended up in the outhouse. But I loved books. And that was with the exception of one book that was always in our house. And that was the Bible that my mother used to read to us. And in fact, it was from my mama's reading that made me realize just how important it is for parents to read to their kids. And although I go on with a lot of foolishness, it was very important those times that we spent with mama because she used to read these books. And buddy, I mean, when she read, we could see it happening. In fact, one of the songs that I wrote years later was a song uh, called Coat of Many Colors, which is a song that actually became a big hit that Mama had read uh, from the Bible. And of course, Mama used to always make quilts and make all the clothes that all the kids, you know, that had, because, you know, people used to send Mama big boxes and bags of scraps to make quilts out of. And this one particular time in my life, I needed a coat. So Mama had made this coat for me. And I realize now, years later, that she told me the story about Joseph and the coat of many colors to make me not ashamed to wear that coat to school. Of course, I was so proud, I couldn't wait to wear that coat to school because I thought I looked exactly like Joseph. But when I got to school, the kids laughed at me because really it was just scraps and rags, but mama had made me feel proud of it, knowing that they probably would make fun of me. And I was hurt and I was kind of angry at mama because I felt like she'd lied to me. And I went home and I told her, you know, that everybody laughed at my coat and they didn't think I looked like Joseph at all and that we was poor. And she said, honey, we're not poor. Look around you. We got a lot of love. We got a lot of stuff. We got enough to eat. We don't have everything we want, but we've always got something to eat. So mama instilled that in me. And I don't know if any of you even remember that little story of the coat of many colors, but you know, it talks about like in my coat of many colors that my mama made for me, made only from rags, but I wore it so proudly. And although we had no money, I was rich as I could be. In my coat of many colors, Mama made for me. You know, people will make fun of you and people kind of point you out because you're different. And I know that memory really, really hurt me. And uh, for years and years, and it was only after I wrote that song and it became a hit that that hurt left me. It's amazing how healing money can be. I thought, well, you know what? It's only right and fair that um, I'm going to take this money that I made, my first royalty check, and buy Mama something special. So I, I was living in Nashville at that time, and I went back home to East Tennessee, which is 200 miles, you know, east of Nashville. So I said, Mama, get your pocketbook. I'm taking you to Knoxville, and I'm going to buy you the best mink coat they got. This was years ago when people were still wearing mink. I was very proud of that particular little coat, and I just trailed way off my story, didn't I? And it's not about just clothes. Sometimes it's about the color or the size or just being different. And you probably noticed that I still dress a little different. But I wanted to wear something bright and shiny today because I knew this was going to be a dark room, and I wanted to show up because I, I love to be seen. A few years ago, I started a public foundation called the Dollywood Foundation, and that's to help kids in my home county. We started out to help the high school dropout rate, and we did too. In fact, we were able to change it from over 30% to less than 6% in about five years, and I'd say that's pretty good. I had a lot of help with that. So we feel very proud of that, and in addition to still having this little imagination library, we still work very close with the kids and still give out scholarships and anything that we can do up there to try to help, but we're especially proud of this little imagination library. And for those of you that want to know a little more about what it is, the uh, Imagination Library is a program that we started. It's in Sevier County, and we give a book a month to every child from the day they're born until their kindergarten age. And so that's 60 books with a little bookcase that's in a little engine and a caboose on a track, which is cute. And the engine and caboose expand apart and it makes room for each of the books. And of course, the first book they get is the book of the little engine that could, which they love that. And the mail, they mail these books directly to these kids. In fact, a lot of the kids just wait at the mailbox at the first of every month to get their little book, and most of them think that I bring them myself. 
They do, and I think that is the cutest thing, and sometimes they leave presents in the box, like I'm Santa Claus or something, and they'll ask their parents if they saw me that day or did Dolly leave my book. So it makes me feel real happy to know that I can be that much of a part of a child's life and possibly some way to try to change its life for the better. And we hope as many communities as we can find will help us sponsor the work that we're doing and replicate the program. And uh, we've just started, and we have several Pro, uh, things in progress. We have a bank in Pratt, Kansas, and an individual in Georgia, and uh, we'll work with civic groups, corporations, politicians, or anybody else is willing to help us out with the program. So, again, if you want more information on that, I believe we have that available, or you can talk to Ted Miller over here, or David Dodson. Uh, they'll help you with any of that. So, uh, today, I have a very special um, you know, Stampede Company, and yesterday we made the announcement that we donated $7 million through the Dixie Stampede to expand the Imagination Library, so we felt very proud to be able to do that. And We're looking for other help because I can't do it all myself. I've already told you that I have to keep some money for myself because uh, it costs a lot to make a person look this cheap, and, but I am proud to be able to do my part. And, of course, we have uh, Dixie Stampedes. It's like a dinner theater where we actually have all these beautiful horses. And we have one in Branson, Missouri. We have one up in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. We have one in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And now we're hopefully going to have the one in Orlando and in Australia. So we're just growing with that. And uh, we feed and entertain thousands of folks, and a lot of them bring a lot of their kids. So it just seemed great that we would be able to donate money from the Dixie Stampede to help with the Imagination Library. So the mission of my Dollywood Foundation is to dream more, learn more, more, do more, and care more. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, putting all this together a few years back, I wanted to write a little something that would kind of, kind of say what it's like to, if you try, that there's not anything that you can't do really if you give it enough effort. And I wrote a little song called Try, and I'll read it like a poem. And I didn't bring my guitar because I didn't know how kind of a setup would do, but anyhow, my husband's Church of Christ and they like to sing with no music. I don't. I'm a holy roller. I like all the music I can get. But anyhow, so this little a song, I think kind of says what we all need. It says, I've chased after rainbows and I've captured one or two and I've reached for the stars and I've even held a few. I've walked that lonesome valley, topped the mountains, soared the sky. I've laughed and I've cried, but I've always tried. And I've always been a dreamer, and dreams are special things, but dreams are of no value if they're not equipped with wings. So secure yourself for climbing, make ready for the sky. Don't let your chance go by. You'll make it if you try. And there's more. <laughs> so try to be the first one up the mountain, the highest flying dreamer in the sky. Try your best to be an inspiration for others that are still afraid and shy. Try to make the most of every moment. If you fail, get up and try again. Try each day to try a little harder. Because if you never try, you never win. Nothing is impossible if you can just believe. Don't live your life in shackles when faith can be your key. The winner's one that keeps determination in his eyes, who's not afraid to fly and not afraid to try. So at least you'll know that I'm out there trying, and I really do want to thank all of you for any support that you might give us as far as the press, because we feel like if we can bring enough attention to this that we will make other people aware. And I know we all want to help the kids. It's like, and if we can help them when they're little and when they're young, in their most impressionable years, it might last a lifetime. And So we have lots of wonderful things going on, and I understand that uh, they do have a bunch of questions, and he said he's going to read them all, but if any of you feel like you want to holler something out that you want to know. You've written an awful lot of lyrics. The one that always got my attention was, I'm just a country road that you keep turning down. But oh, I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's, your, what's your favorite country lyric that you ever wrote? The one that I wrote? Well, the one that I, is my favorite song is Code of Many Colors, but the one I like the most because it made me the most money is I Will Always Love You. What book had the greatest effect on you? Huh. 
Well, I guess the Bible, actually, because that's the one that I heard first and learned first. But actually, one of the reasons that we picked the little engine that could, I always loved that little story when I was a kid. And so uh, I have several books. I've always loved books. And I don't remember a time when I couldn't read because I'm so thankful for that because I think if you can read, that you can just go anywhere and be anything in the whole wide world and just kind of, and I love fairy tales. So I, I still guess the Bible. Someone thought your last movie with Burt Reynolds was just wonderful and wants to know, were you ever going to make another film with Burt Reynolds? Well, that must have been the best little chicken house in Texas that you was talking about. I don't know. I haven't seen Burt in, in a long time. Uh, we, we haven't talked about doing any movies, but it was fun. I love working with all those guys. I have better success with the women. Have you ever had any problems remaining close to your roots while you're such a public person? No, in fact, I think that's the thing that's kept me sane. I, um, I try to always remember where I came from, who I am, and why I wanted to do this to start with. It was not to get away from my family. It was not because I wasn't proud of my home that I wanted to leave it. I just wanted to take the Smoky Mountains wherever I went, and I did. I would give the same advice to a young woman as a young man. Anybody that has a dream, I think, first of all, in order to achieve that dream, you have to believe in it. You have to be willing to work for it. You have to be willing to sacrifice. I've always believed that I had more guts than I had talent, but you do have to put some backbone behind what you dream. So if you, uh, if you believe in what it is that you're after, well, just stick with it until you see it ain't going to work and then change into something that might. Of all the performing arts that uh, you're involved in, producing and acting and singing, which is your favorite? Well, my favorite personal thing to do is to write songs. I love to sing, but I think writing is my favorite thing because it's kind of something I can do. A lot of people can sing, but I don't think a lot of people write. I don't know that I'm that good, but I just get excited when I get a chance to write because it's like I feel like maybe there'll be something in the world tomorrow that wasn't here today. So good or bad, it just gives me something creative to do. And it's kind of like my therapy. If I can write it down, if I'm happy, then I can write about that. If I'm sad, I can write about that. It saves money on uh, psychiatrists too. What do you do to make sure that the readings that you're giving the kids are right for the development of those kids at the stage of life that they're at? Do you have experts consulting with you about literacy? I'm glad you asked that question because I would never even dream of taking it on myself to pick a book for a young child to read. But we do have wonderful, well, a committee of people that decide on which books we give out through the library. We have authors and we have people that work with children. And we have, like, uh, child psychologists and different things and educators that decide on what they think would be the best for children of that age. And uh, then, of course, the parents get a chance to read with them the kids too but we don't take it on ourselves to think that we learn that's a lot of responsibility it's hard to know how to how to deal with children anyway and exactly what to teach them but I just think that if we all try a little harder going back to the song try I think if we try to find out what is best for our children I think we could give them a much better start than some of them get where do you turn for information about what kids need how do you teach yourself what kids need well, like I say, even as a parent, which I have no children, I've uh, been instrumental in helping raise several of my younger brothers and sisters, but you really have to pay attention to the child. You have to actually respect the nature and the personality of a child, because every child is different. My mother was a great example of that, because she had 12 children, six boys and six girls, and every one of us were different. We have similar you know, personality traits, but our desires and our needs were completely different. So you have to turn to God for the first thing, like my mama would, that's what I do, you know, if I'm needing direction about anything, and especially about children. And then again, as I say, you turn to the people, the experts, the people that are supposed to know, and just hope that you're doing the right thing. There's a lot of uh, philanthropic work that goes on, foundations like yours and other uh, wealthy people who use their money for social purposes. But the government has a role to play, too. Do you ever think about what the government ought to be doing, and do you have advice for the government in this area? Well, I try not to get too involved in any political issues, but I think the government, as well as parents, and as well as communities, organizations, everybody should get involved, especially get involved with trying to help the youth and the children you know, of, of the day. So I think we could always do more. It's just like when people say to me, oh, it's so nice of you that you're doing this, you're doing that, and I think, well, I could and should be doing so much more, but at least if you're trying to do something, maybe out of all that, if enough people do try to do something, I think that eventually maybe we'll make a 
more of a difference than we have. But yes, I think the government should do more with everything. <laughs> Are you writing songs? Do you have another uh, album in the works these days? Well, I have the bluegrass album. You just mentioned that this is a big bluegrass uh, community here. I don't know why that is, but I guess it's because people come from different places. My new album is called The Grass is Blue. It's the first authentic, full bluegrass album that I've done. I've, I grew up with bluegrass music. And uh, this one, I mean, I've done different bluegrass songs and different albums scattered around. But this one, we used only the best bluegrass authentic musicians. And the difference in bluegrass and country, for those of you that don't know, it's like in, in bluegrass, you uh, work twice as hard, get half the money. But you have twice the fun. It's a great music, and it's all acoustic is the difference. It's the uh, harmonies that make it so special. And all the acoustic instruments like mandolins, banjos, no drums, no electric bass or any of that. But I plan to actually get more involved in music, uh, you know, like the folk music. In fact, my next album hopefully is going to be a folk album. And uh, so we may call it Common Folk. That's what the title is at the moment. A lot of the old songs that I grew up with that Mama used to sing. She not only used to read to us, she used to also sing all the old mountain songs, the old English ballads and Scottish and Irish ballads. So I'm going to do some more of those things as the time goes by, in addition to some of the other stuff. What is it that made you move beyond the, the country music that I used to hear when I was growing up in Tennessee and to go into the more exploratory areas, folk, bluegrass, and so on? Well, actually, the folk and bluegrass was part of my growing up and the country, but actually getting on involved in, in the pop music, I just love being able to do everything because I have a very outgoing personality, as you might have noticed. And I just really love to feel like I'm part of everything. I don't, I don't want to feel like just because I'm a country girl and grew up in the country that that's all I get to do. But by the same token, the fact that I get to be in the movies and be on television and sing pop, my gut still says I'm a country girl, and those songs actually ring truer to me than anything else that I do because that's part of the fabric of my whole being and my whole upbringing. So uh, I, I hope to continue to do all sorts of things just as long as people let me and there's a market for it. What are the trade-offs with celebrity and fame uh, against your loss of privacy and so on? Well, that's a good question. I, I really wanted to be a star. I have to honestly say that I have such an outgoing personality that I don't look at it like some of the stars that get to be famous and then they despise the people for running after them or wanting autographs. I appreciate it. I can't always do everything that everybody asks me to do or sign every autograph, but I really love the people and I think that if you really like doing what you do, that you'll find a way to make that work for you. And I know that, you know, if it gets to be dangerous so I don't have to run around with you know, with security all the time because I really refuse to live my life in a bubble. You know, I like to go do the things and I know when and where I can go and what I can do to be safe with it. And it doesn't bother me for people to recognize me. In fact, I think I'd be very disappointed if they didn't. And that's why I dress like this when I go to the store. There's great people in the South. And it's like people talk about how ignorant we are. We're not ignorant. We're just, most of us are just uneducated. And I think that's where it comes from because the smartest people I know are the people who can't read and write. Like you ought to know my daddy. He don't even know how to write our names and read our names. But like you give him a project or something to do, he's just brilliant. So I think that until we get educations and actually get, and it's not everybody, there's a lot of pretty smart people come from the South. And so it's not just about that, but I think education is the key to all knowledge. How did you get into the theme park business with Dollywood? And could you describe a little bit what your future plans for Dollywood are? Well, um, when I first got in the business, I think there was a thing in me that always wanted my people to be proud of me and my family. So I wanted to be able to do something where I could go back home and not only just say, here's something I've done. I'm the girl from here that loves this place, that, you know, that, do, that I do have a lot of pride in the area that I'm from. And I thought years and years ago that I wanted to do something like a park. And then I got very lucky and got in business with my partners, the folks from Silver Dollar City, the Hershen family. And of course, this man right here, Ted Miller, is the one that kind of helped me pull all that together because they knew I was coming up there to build a park. They already had some things going on there. So we just got together and we put together what I think is one of the greatest partnerships in the world. And it has provided not only fun and recreation, 
in that part of the country, but it's provided thousands and thousands of jobs, and the whole area has really grown in leaps and bounds because of some of the stuff that we started. Of course, we can't take credit for the Great Smoky Mountains. They were there a long time for me, and that's a great place. But we have provided a lot of new things, a lot of jobs for the folks there, and we've done so well, and the folks enjoy it, families that come to Dollywood. We hope to do just like what we're doing with the Dixie Stampede Dinner Theaters, uh, we love the people that we work with there, Fred Hardwick and all the folks with Dixie Stampede. We also have wonderful partnerships with them, and we just hope to continue to build parks maybe all over the country and possibly all over the world. I'd love to have a Dollywood one, two, three, and four, five, six, or seven, whatever. A number of people said, how do you stay so pretty? Oh, my. And, <laughs> and in particular, what's your exercise program? <laughs> well, I'm basically physically lazy. I don't like to exercise, but, uh, you know, I'm one of those people that, you know, if I see something bagging, sagging, and dragging, I'll go have it fixed. How would you critique the stage presentations of George Bush and Tennessee's own Al Gore? I'm not getting into politics. <laughs> What's a harder business to be in, acting or singing? Well, I enjoy the singing the most, but I guess acting is a harder job. It's slow. That's what I don't like about it, because when you do a movie, you have to wait like three months. It takes three to four months to do a movie, plus you have to prepare for like a year, and I'm really kind of one of those one-nighter kind of gals. I'd rather just go out there, sing, and get it over with. So I like the uh, instant gratification of singing and doing concerts, but the movies, if you do something good, the end results kind of pay off, but uh, I do enjoy the singing the most. Did you ever have any formal music training? And when you were a kid, did you practice? How did you get to be such a musician? Well, I don't know that I'm such a musician, but thank you for that. But I, my family's very musical, my mother's people especially, and I grew up singing in the church. That's my mama's people. My grandpa was a Pentecostal preacher, so that's where I learned to sing, all of us did. And everybody played some sort of a musical instrument, and I can play several different instruments, but when you're a kid, everybody's playing something, you just walk up to them and say, show me that chord, show me this chord. But I never had a lesson in my life. I don't know one note from another, but I make up all my melodies, and I make up the words, but I don't know if it's if when they write it out, when I'm having my copyrights done, I couldn't tell you if it's right or not unless somebody sits down and plays it at the piano and reads the music. But uh, so you don't really have to have an education. I wish I did know how to read music, but for me to start now would be to mess up some other stuff I got going. Sort of like Chet Atkins said once when they had asked him to play uh, in with the Boston Pops. They were in Nashville and the orchestra was there. And, and they asked Chet, they laid some music out, and he said, they said, well, Chet, do you read? He said, not enough to hurt my picking. What kind of reading do you enjoy? Well, I love everything. I, I read a lot of spiritual books, but I love every great new book that comes out, all the bestsellers, and I've always you know, loved it. My favorite Southern writer uh, is now, this day and time, is a lady named Lee Smith. I love all of her things. And she's a lady that lives in North Carolina, and she's written some great things. But I just, I read all sorts of things. I still read the Bible. <laughs> this says you're known as a role model. How did that happen? Are you religious? Well, I'm spiritual. I, I don't say that I'm religious at all. And being a role model, I think that I've been around so long, and I think people just uh, know that I look totally artificial but that I'd like to think they know that I'm real. And I, I think that people know that I really care about them and I really care about myself. I care about my family and about the things that one should care about. But nobody's perfect, me of all people, but I have a good time and I try to just stand up for the things that I do believe in and be honest and fair about that. And if I've meant something to somebody, especially a young person, to be a role model, you know, that's a wonderful compliment. It's a big responsibility, but I still figure I best just be myself and not try to be anything different than what I am, and then the, that's a good example, great. Do you find that, that foreigners appreciate country music, and do you find that they understand what's going on in the United States? Well, I really have found through the years, and I've traveled all over the world, but there's there are so many people that love country music that it's amazing to me. And even like when we go to Japan, it's like I'm I'm very popular in Japan, believe it or not. And they don't know a word I'm saying. I think it's because I'm little and uh, short, and I think the you know well whatever they seem to like little blondes with big 
biggins. And, uh, <laughs> but they just, you know, they just seem to, I think there's something about country music that you feel. I know certainly like in Australia or like in, you know, the places where you actually can understand it, like in Ireland and uh, in England and Australia. That's why I was talking about having great fans in Australia. They appreciate it, but I think people feel the emotion that comes, that's sung in country music. And I think emotion, doesn't have a language it just kind of speaks itself it has its own language and I think people mostly just love it because they feel that it's something real and, and it touches them somewhere in the deep parts now do you take much influence from foreign music into your own music well I most definitely have been influenced and I think what we call country music so much of that actually was born from the old songs that were brought over from the old country and like in the Appalachian Mountains, of course, with the Irish and English folk songs. And most of the songs that I was talking about that I planned to do on a folk album came from the old world. So I think that that influenced all of country music. So I think it's just people, real people, singing about, telling about, writing about real things. I think it's like simple, ordinary stories told in an extraordinary way, I'd like to think. You mentioned an interest in cutting a folk album. Can you tell us a little bit of who your folk music heroes are? Actually, I, uh, the people that have influenced me the most have been people like in my family and people that I have worked with in doing the research with a lot of this old music. Of course, I love all sorts of, of music and I have a lot of country music favorites, but most of the folks that I have been most touched by have been people that have come from my part of the country. Just some of the older folks that would sit back there on their porches and sing and play their dulcimers and their banjos, a lot of them being a lot of my own relatives. And then of course you try to find all the old folk things that you can as you travel around and try to pick up tapes and you know cassettes and just kind of study on that it's kind of like a like a history lesson to learn all about that in different parts of the country to search out what the music is there in their area my heart just loves you and i am so happy to be standing here getting to do things like this and big old bunch of important people and i think i always think it's a long way from the you know, to, to the top of the world, from the top of the Smoky Mountains. And just thank God for folks like you that allowed me to see my Smoky Mountain dreams come true.